Today's oral history is with Elmer George, who at the time we shot this in 2017 was 100 years old, or 100 years young, as I like to say, because I do not think of Elmer as old. I think of him as having another 20 or more years to go before he comes to any real slowing in his life. The time I first had a social engagement with Elmer was with him and his wife when I came to a Christmas party at the retirement home and he said, welcome, Rick. I want you to know that Marty and I are celebrating our 54th anniversary of our 39th year. After some quick math, I finally figured out they were both celebrating their 94th birthdays together. Marty died a little over two years later. They'd been married for 72 years since they were 21. And they'd been best friends since they were 10 years old. Elmer said in his interview that Marty's death was the most difficult time he has ever experienced is in, in his entire life. And yet somehow, he has found a way to go on. Certainly he has the love and the support of his three daughters, but Elmer has something more. He always has had an indomitable spirit to living and a dedication to helping others. His story is one of optimistic determination. He is a person always looking for a way to improve the lives of others and improve the way of doing things himself. Although aging has slowed him down physically, he is routinely finding ways to adapt, integrate, and accommodate his changing situation with acceptance, positivity, and I would say a plum. There is little historically extraordinary about Elmer and the life he has led. He is indeed an everyday elder. Yet he loves and he lives life every day. He always has. I don't envy Elmer's life or wish that I were he, but I do wish that I could share his perspective, his passion and compassion, his dedication, and his appreciation for life. Here now, Elmer George. to San Francisco when I was age 10 and my, my mother was working at San Francisco General Hospital so what did she do with a small boy to keep him out of mischief and she got me a job selling newspapers on uh, right near our home and then uh, on Sunday she took me to the Protestant Church the uh, uh, West Side Christian Church on Bush and Divisdale Street and uh, I was a member there until uh, and its successor until I came here um, 17 years ago. And uh, while I was there then, I was active in a very wonderful young people's group all about my age, and some of us are still in contact uh, really? 90 years later. But um, I was just uh, a, a sort of a, a leader in the uh, song and, and choir uh, part of the life as I grew older. Uh, without realizing what I was doing. But for instance, I never had a good singing voice, but I did make sure that everybody had a song book and do the right page and that sort of thing. And so because of that then, we had a very good singing group all the way along. And uh, did with that. And so uh, then uh, I was uh, sort of chosen to be uh, a leader. I chaired over these years uh, every committee 
uh, that we had in the church except the Christian Women's Fellowship. They never allowed me to be a member of that, but uh, I that. had all the others and from time to time. And so uh, after a while, uh, with this, uh, we were in the Fillmore District, and so the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Negro group were being ousted to a changing in the neighborhood, so we sold our church to them, and then we moved out on uh, right near Laguna Honda Home, uh, right on the uh, on the Laguna Honda Boulevard, and uh, it was worked out very well. And uh, somewhere along the line, got the idea that tithing was the uh, ex expected from me, and so my wife and I t uh, tithed. But my wife and I knew each other since we were. Um, ten years, I was part of the, his, fam, her family were part of the church, so that, so uh, at age 18 we wanted to get married, but the uh, boys were not, the girls could uh, marry without their mother's permission uh, at 18, but the boys had to be 21. So we waited till I was age 21 and two weeks and then we married. And uh, <laughs> we prayed for children, and then when we found out how to do it, we had three and four years, three daughters, and we're very fortunate in that the girls now in their 70s love each other, no matter where they live in the, in the world, they communicate with each other, and uh, so they're. But uh, when my mother uh, was uh, fell off the roof one time, uh, I needed help with her, and the church was kind enough to put her into a, helped me put her into a home in Los Angeles, Rosemead, uh, California Christian Home in Rosemead, California, and there I got uh, there the proper uh, amount of money that I had to pay, which was very little, and it was just a thank you to me for all that I had done in the church. But then I became a member of that board, which was very similar to where we live here. They had a health center and they had residences and all of that. And a very interesting thing in that the church was in the center and then in the homes all around it. Uh, we bought those homes as we could and so then we had people living uh, who had to have one meal a day in the main building but otherwise they were there and one of the great pleasures in my mind was to see uh, the people from living in this one walk over to a home to play bridge or something like that mm. and it was a wonderful wonderful community mm -hmm. and then also uh, they uh, elected me uh, to what we called our board of church extension which was exactly that it helped uh, 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 churches uh, with their finances and we came up with the idea of paying them a half a percent more than they could get at bank at one of the banks. And so because of that, we had the funds then to work with, and uh, the people had the satisfaction of getting a little bit more for their money, but also knowing that it was helping churches so that it worked out very well. But a very interesting thing all the way along and that is that as I grew older, I realized that about every 10 years, people would get dissatisfied with the clergyman, with the leader and all. And so then there'd be an unrest grow and I could just see it grow. And my job and one that I felt had to be done would be to try to ease it down and get them to forgive and to accept and that sort of thing. And that <coughs> happened all the way along through the whole process even with the Board of Church Extension. So uh, it was a very interesting challenge all the way along, but it was it. And so then I, would, I was a member there until many of our people who live here go to their church, their former church. But I felt that when I got here, then I should uh, wanted to uh, support the chapel and the local uh, work, and so that's what I've done. And so uh, that's sort of uh, where I am at the moment. Tell me, in, uh, in that religious experience, can you talk a little bit about your faith? Faith? Mm -hmm. uh, my faith, I believe, well, let's see, let's do it this way. I think it sums it up. Every, during the day, I say, thank you, Lord. But every night before I go to bed, I say, thank you for all of the good things that have happened to me and my family. Thank you very, 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 very much. And then also prepare me to sleep during the night, the challenges of 
uh, trying to, because I sleep in during a couple of times during the day, to be rest, to not too restless at night, and to do that. And so, please help me through the night to prepare for the next day, and then find, help me find ways that I can help other people around here who need help. So that sums it up, sort of. Mm -hmm. I believe in God. In other words, I believe He's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, at a hundred years old, yes. you have several projects that you do. Certainly the ties are yes. one of the main ones. Yeah, ties and, and just being aware uh, of what people. We have one lady here who's um, in stealing food from the uh, other people's uh, uh, refrigerators and uh, taking uh, my doorbell off my door. Um, she one time I was polishing the put the new doorbell up on my door. She came along and I was uh, polishing it with a rag. So at two o'clock in the morning for several days I would be awakened because she was in, uh, polishing my doorknob. So I asked her to stop doing it and she did. Other people here are asking her to stop stealing their food or doing this and the other and in not having any good luck. So I'm trying to think of some way. Uh, I have one lady who is a former nurse and I've encouraged her to tell uh, this lady when it's meal times and just to try to be a friend to her and maybe that will help. And so uh, there's that sort of opportunity mm -hmm. around here is to help other people. Well it sounds it also, though, sounds sort of superficial when somebody says, well, you make these ties and you've got one on. You should. Uh -huh. But the fact of the matter is, and you've done over 750 or so ties. Yeah. And tell me about the ties, because it's more than just sure. art. There's right. a lot that goes on behind that. What is that? I always had to wear a necktie. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came here, men no longer have, oh, incidentally, this is called a necktie. Remember, you used to have one? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, <laughs> in other words, I could get them for 25 cents a piece. Yeah. They were selling them for a dollar, but I told them that I had just found a place where they were selling them for 25 cents, and they had boxes and boxes, so they were glad to have an excuse to get rid of them, so I did it. But uh, when I was in the drapery and upholstery business, my job was to uh, I'd be invited into a home that the customer loved, but somebody had burned a hole in the sofa. My job was to replace that with a fabric that was so similar to the one that she loved that she paid me immediately, and then her husband didn't know there had been a change till he saw the invoice a month later. So uh, in other words, that was my job. So that's what I do though then, is try to get the tie that blends with the tie, uh, I'm sorry, with the design, with the tie itself, and so that they're all blending together. And so uh, to me that was, it's, a, it's an interesting project. It helps me use my computer and my computer skills, and at the same time then people make comments on it uh, it isn't that common at all for some stranger to walk by as I do it and say, what a nice tie, and uh, that gives me, a, gives me pleasure. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, that's the story of the ties. It, but well, there's, there's more to it than that, because those yeah. ties, many of those ties actually are profiles or or tributes to residents here at the Heritage yes, or I other things. Yes, I do that things. also, yes. So there are... That's another thing that I do is uh, if they have a blouse, the ladies have a blouse that's very colorful, uh, then I take a picture of the back of it. Sometimes they don't even know I do it. So they're very thrilled, well, most of the time, they're very thrilled then when they see their blouse and themselves on the back here. But many times also they say it makes me look pregnant. <laughs> It's of not course. uncommon at all. Of and so uh, when I get a comment, so then when that happens, then I do it again and make it a little narrower so that they don't look as wide as they did. Or yeah, something you can like digitally. That. Precisely that, because the object is to try to make them like it, but it, uh, it most of the time it works. Mm -hmm. But at least I get a comment out of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you also, at times, I mean, for example, with Margaret, you've done two or three ties of Margaret. Yes. 
and there's some biographical information you often put together with those ties. I try, it? yes. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to do is give them some memories so that a year later or so, I say, they say, oh, they say, oh I'd forgotten about I did, by that I did that. So mm -hmm. yes, uh, it's, it's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, then I have to have them arranged in such a way. I only have one, we live in one room here, and so I found a saucer-like effect that holds 21 ties, and then I put it on a rod so that in this space I can have about 100 ties. Wow. So I have that then in my closet door, my toilet door, mm -hmm. my every door uh, that I can, and then I have also a divider screen that gives me sort of the feeling of a bedroom, and so then I have two extra walls and that's what I did in my drapery business too, was to try to have things so people could see rather than select from little postage stamp sample. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, try to be as practical as I can, yes. So let me back up a little bit. Sure. Here. You were born in the city? No, I was born in Merced, though I don't have any idea, recollection of that oh, at all. Okay. I also, before I came here at age 10, I had lived in Ari Phoenix, Arizona, my wife, my wife, my, my, just my mother and I, and she moved around quite a bit. Why, I'm not quite sure. And uh, my, uh, she and her, my father had separated when I was two years old. So, uh, and then she had been married uh, other times before, two or three times uh, before she married my father. So uh, it's quite an interesting. My father was Portuguese, and they told me that if I went down to Mor to uh, Monterey, I'd see a lot of people that have my coloring and all of that sort of thing, though I haven't done it. And then my mother's uh, maiden name was Mahoney, so uh, that tells you something. So mm -hmm. uh, that's my background, yeah. Hmm. Um, so your mother was married several times. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, she had, uh, I had uh, a half sister and a half brother, and uh, then uh, the, I had a, a also a brother uh, younger than I, but he passed away. Was that in childhood, or was All that? Of the, yes, in before I came here at age ten. Okay. Uh, this uh, with the, no, with the half sister, the, uh, with the half brother was it was in the army, and uh, I met him from time to time but really didn't get to know him. And then the half-sister lived with us for a while. Um, she would, I'd see her when she was in trouble in some way or another, and she'd come around to, to get some help from my mother. But uh, otherwise, we were not, so I wasn't close to any of them. Mm -hmm. Didn't really know them, so I was, I was always pretty much on my own. Well, so in spite of your mother's uh, moving around. Yes. You married Marty at I 18 did. and 21. Yes, exactly. And, and we had 72 years. 72 years. And she, we both moved in here, and then not too long after that she developed cancer, and then she died in our health center here mm -hmm. after getting very, very excellent care, you know. Yeah, that was what, four years ago? No, about uh, six years ago. Six years ago. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then we have three daughters, and uh, mm -hmm. one of them, uh, Linda, uh, married a young uh, Englishman uh, who was starting something with the United States government that was quite new. Uh, instead of going into another country, uh, he was an agri agricultural uh, ec 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 agriculture is a, is a field, and uh, instead of going into another country and tell them they need more fertilizer, uh, he developed a team of agronomists and geographers and two or three other crafts, and they studied uh, a, how a, in Africa a group could feed a large group of family out of one small plot of land that would have ten, ten different crops in it. And when they understood how that worked after several years, then they went to places like to, that had the same climate, like Tahiti, and taught them how to feed better. So the United States did that and should take great, great pride in doing it. But that's what he did. But anyway then, uh, that was my eldest daughter, spent about 25 years in Africa, 
Then my second daughter, Sally, lives just always in San Francisco, and right now she's my, my tremendous help here and uh, coming once a week and doing my laundry and anything else that there's always a number of things that she can do. And then my youngest daughter married three times over her lifetime. They both, they're all in their 70s, but uh, she has, uh, well, just an example of who she is. She lived in an apartment in Australia that looked out over the ocean without any road in between, just beautiful. And then there was a young man a little older than she living here, but pretty soon he was living here too. And they kept their own names, but they were together here until they decided they wanted to take a world cruise and then they had to have the same name so they could share. So that's one reason to get married was so you get the same name and so that you could take a cruise and that's what she did. But unfortunately after about eight years he passed away so now she's very happily content living in Australia and has many, many, many friends there and very active in a Protestant church and all that sort of thing. Now, what are the names of your first daughter and your third daughter, then? Uh, Nancy is the youngest daughter, Sally is the second, and Linda is the oldest. Linda, Sally, mm -hmm. Nancy. <clears throat> um, I'd like to play a little game, if you will. And I think I've got it in my... No, here we go what I would call rapid fire. I want rapid fire. Rapid fire? Okay. That is to say, ask you a series of questions that have very short responses and that'll help trigger kind Let's of rhythm. It. Okay. What's your favorite color? Red. What's your favorite smell? I guess flower, uh, roses, uh, the, or the aroma for, of a rose. Mm-hmm. Um, who was your best friend growing up? Or just... Yes, very good. Very, very good. I'd forgotten about Jim. Uh, Jim here in San Francisco was a little, uh, about the same age as I, and uh, he would hang around the uh, corner where I was selling newspapers. And uh, when we were wrestling uh, too vigorously, uh, the cars would stop and tell us to stop, to stop <laughs> doing it that sort of thing. But we were good friends, yes, Jim and I. And that was in youth then, if you're selling newspapers? Yes, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Age uh, 14, let's say. Okay. Um, favorite hobby? Or any of your hobbies? Church, I think. Church is a hobby. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. It was the only um, activity in which I was active. Hmm. The most difficult time you had I guess the death of my wife mm -hmm. recently. See, she we worked together in in, in my store. She uh, had her half of the store, which was paying the bills and taking care of the, uh, the government requirements and that sort of thing. And my job was to bring in the money so she could pay the bills mm -hmm. and work with the customers. Okay. Greatest pleasure? I think it was satisfaction uh, in uh, Sylvanus of uh, coming up with a way that uh, uh, paid the bills instead of having uh, just uh, a small sample book that people had been buying a whole wall of drapery. I would own the bolt of fabric and make a uh, profit on, on the fact that I had it and also never had to tell a customer that we had run out of it because I owned it. And so then I'd cut drapery lengths, borrow wire coat hangers, and I'd have a whole wall of draperies. And while she and her, her sister or mother-in-law were talking, then I would be doing my arithmetic. And if I'd hear them say, I don't like that one, then I'd take it down and put up another. So when they knew what they were going to get, and I got a lot of satisfaction out of the fact that uh, they, they were pleased. What was your most fun ever? 
whatever. I think it's these days uh, <laughs> probably it, and that's the enjoyment I get out of working with a computer, especially working free cell uh, solitaire. Do you know free cell solitaire? Mm -hmm. Sure. By chance, okay. And uh, being able to win. Mm -hmm. and I think that's that's the one that I'm really really enjoying. But also uh, just the life around here, uh, feeling that I'm accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. Did you know your father? Um, interesting thing, uh, this uh, from time to time there'd be a taxi across the street from where I was selling newspapers. Many times I was lagging nickels to the wall with a neighborhood boy or two, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I could uh, to go over and talk to him, and I knew that he didn't approve of my gambling and these older boys taking advantage of me. But um, I told him that I was holding my own on it and so that. So we, we had that sort of thing, but that was about all. I didn't really get to, until, well, I'll, I'll take that back. When uh, the children came along, uh, I was uh, in my mid-twenties then, uh, then he uh, got, became more friendly, and once in a while we would, during the summer, uh, they, we would take the three daughters up to where he had a place up in Napa, a little small ranch, and then uh, he would, uh, they would love to be up there, and then I'd go up and visit, uh, so we got acquainted a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Describe your mother. <clears throat> mother was a very hard working lady. Uh, she was a very practical lady uh, in that uh, she had to run a house and work all day and night and yet at the same time uh, she uh, took it. Oh and then the other thing that happened when we were age 21 uh, and shortly the children came along. We hired my mother away from the hospital. We paid her the same salary. My wife and I paid her the same salary and she raised the three girls so that we could be in the store day and night as we had mm -hmm. to be. And so, so got acquainted. Um, I'm going to digress here a second sure. before I go on. So how did you get into the drapery business? I was at City of Paris. This is my first job now. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, uh, 1934, when I graduated from high school, uh, the height of the depression, nothing available any place. A lady from the city, from the church, uh, was also in charge of part of City of Paris, and she hired me and put me to work there. So my job was to go around from the wrapping desks and I'd use a uh, uh, just a laundry cart, take the packages down to the room. In those days, the department stores mailed or delivered uh, packages uh, that you didn't have to take them home on the bus. And so, uh, consequently, uh, I was uh, doing that from uh, playroom. Then after that, I got a job in the elevators and I was running the elevator, I was uh, operating an elevator and uh, in those days we had to open the door of the elevator by hand and the one thing I remember was a lady outside, are you going up? Yes, madam, we're going up. Well, I'm going down. And so uh, that was that sort of thing that happened too. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, then from there then, I, there was a vacancy in the drapery department and this is where I start bragging a little bit. The vacancy, so I was a stock boy and my job was to put the bolts away or at least to tell the sales group and where they were and uh, that kind of thing. And then when I wasn't busy, then I would help a customer and uh, the one after several years, uh, they uh, started publishing how much each of the 17 salespeople had sold. And I was keeping track, and I, this is the truth, I had sold more than any salesperson, even though I was just the stock boy. So I went up to the office and say, they said, Mr. George, that's not possible. And I said, will you check the accountant, please? And they looked at it and said, you start as a salesman on Monday. So that's the way I became a salesman. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of proud of that. Tell me about the city of Paris. city of Paris was wonderful. It was a, f a family owned uh, people that came from France. And so the ceiling was very special, but it was uh, copied after the uh, Galerie Lafayette in Paris. 
and uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful store, uh, family-owned store. At Christmas, well, at Thanksgiving, we were invited, after the Thanksgiving evening, we were invited to come down to the store and help to decorate the floor-to-ceiling Christmas tree that was in the, the lobby there. If we didn't show up, we might as well not show up on Saturday because we no longer had a job. But anyway, then we decorated that. So it was a very individually owned store. And one of the lovely things that happened was that when I went into business for myself, after being there many, many, many years, the, uh, the owner, Mr. Verdier, came down and told the salespeople, if anyone asks for Mr. George, you have my permission to say he's going in business for himself. So that was just a lovely, lovely, lovely compliment. Wow. Yeah, wow was right. So um, anyway, it was that kind of city of Paris was that kind of a store, very well known, right in the corner of Division Gero in Stockton, and uh, right across from Basie's, and uh, that not too far from the White House, this sort of thing, but uh, beautifully. And the it was the Gero in Stockton, or uh, no, no, no. Um, sorry. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, Gary, 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 and Gary in Stockton. Yeah. Down, mm -hmm. downtown. So it was, it was, that's right on Union Square. Basically. That's just opposite. In fact, that was one of the pleasures working there. I could go up on the roof, I could watch them digging down and making the garage, under, underground Union garage, Square. which is now Union Square. Right. Yeah, we saw that happen, shovel full by shovel full. Was, is that the Neiman Marcus site? Or is yes, that it the, is. That's where Neiman that's Marcus what I bought them out. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, Neiman Marcus bought them out. Yeah, so it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, but anyway, just very uh, uh, very nice people there, and and uh, it was worked out well for me. I had uh, the, the, we also did upholstering, and we had a contractor who did the upholstering, and uh, he's the one that told me one day that a man out on West Portal Avenue wanted to sell his drapery business. So on my vacation, I went out for two weeks. I worked there without any pay at all. But I found I was working with the same people that I was, the ladies that I was meeting down in the city of Paris. Mm -hmm. So I knew that it was, uh, I'd, I'd be able to It's incredible. It. Yeah. And then I changed the way of doing it and improved it. <clears throat> also, um, one of my favorite stories is about two men who graduated from university in business went into business, but not making a go of it. So they sold the business to a man who obviously hadn't had much education, but his store was always crowded. And so they went in and said, how do you do it? He says, well, I don't know. I work on 4% markup. And they said, well, you can't make it on 4% markup. I do. I buy it for a dollar. I sell it for five dollars. And 4% is all I need, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of what that's I what they to. call a four percent markup, huh? Exactly <laughs> right. So that's what I tried to do is work on. It. I'd buy these bolts of material. I found soon that San Francisco, the people here wanted something just a little bit more sophisticated than they did down the peninsula. So these mills had these materials they wanted to get rid of, and so I could buy a bolt of fabric, still be competitive with a department store, but I paid a lot less for the fabric, so uh, my profit was, was more. So that was helpful. So it was out of things like that that you, you, you do if you want to stay in business. Well, they weren't necessarily seconds then. They were more end of line or end of... End of line. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, very fair. Yes, there had to be uh, materials most of the time that... Uh, and I was very fortunate. There were two, I was at 199 West Portal Avenue, a uh, very busy street, uh, mm -hmm. but I'd have nice displays in the window, and then streetcars going by, people would see what I had and, and they'd come in and all of that. And another favorite story of mine is going up the West Portal with a whole armload of drapery fabrics. And of course, in those days, everybody smoked. Uh, everybody smoked. Mr. George, have you got a match? <laughs> I'm up, I must have one someplace, but I've never met him. <laughs> so I had fun. That's like my line that I heard is, Mr. Beeman, have you got a match? Not since Superman died. Oh, there you <laughs> Good. That's even better. <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> Good.
What's been your greatest fear? Not necessarily now, but... Yes, fear. Mm -hmm. Health always, of course, though I've never had any uh, serious problem. Around here it's falling. We have so many of people course. that fall. And yeah. uh, uh, I fell the, uh, a week or so in the middle of the night and I'm lying on the floor. I had put my hand on a support and the support let go and suddenly I'm in the floor. But fortunately I was able to roll over and, well, uh, in the drapery business I learned how to get up off, uh, after falling off a ladder, I, I, I learned how to get up by moving over in my stomach and uh, hands and knees and all. So I was able to crawl back on the bed and except for a pain on this side which seems to be going away, I didn't have anything serious but uh, I always wear a pendant and that goes into the health center in case right. I needed it. So, uh, but I, I think something like that, uh, just uh, trying to keep from ending up in the health center, yeah. Um, what gives you meaning? You've sort of answered that, but... Meaning? What gives you meaning? What yes. Is, well, it sounds like bragging, but I don't mean it to be, but I think trying to way to help other people, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's where I get my meaning. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that uh, I can do just to people be friendly. Mm -hmm. Today uh, we have one waiter who's, uh, who does wonderful uh, watercolors and uh, has them on the walls all over the place and uh, he specializes in uh, uh, PPIE, the Panama Pacific International Exposition of uh, 1915 mm -hmm. and so he has those up on the walls and uh, we were talking about it today and uh, I was telling him about something that was almost hidden in there, uh, the Indian uh, on his horse uh, who's just so worn out and it's the end of the trail is the name of it and uh, mm -hmm. he has hidden that in, uh, he has it in one of his other paintings where it would have been on the exhibit but it isn't too obvious and as he walked by he kind of patted my back so he just, uh, it just gave him pleasure. Let's talk a little bit about history if you will over your, the course of your life. There are certain very notable events. You were born in 1917? Yes. And so that was the end of World War One. Yes. Uh, what What's your first memory? I was thinking about that today. I wondered if I might come up. Uh, for some reason, I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, for a while, mm -hmm. right on the edge of the city. I had to be. I came here when I was age ten, so uh, it has to be younger than that. I remember uh, going barefoot and uh, burning my feet uh, on the hot ground and then also standing for too long a time in an anthill and uh, that was educational. So uh, it's that sort of thing that I remember. Mm -hmm. it, you were married in 1934. Right. Did you have the drapery business by then or was it shortly thereafter or what? Well, I see I graduated from, from uh, uh, Lowell High School at uh, age 17, so uh, then I went into the drapery, uh, I went into the city of Paris at that time, and so uh, I didn't have the drapery business yet, no. Uh, I was still working at the city of Paris, and my, I was on the elevator, working at the elevator at the time. I remember my wife going out uh, with, after we talked it over, and coming back with an engagement ring that the jeweler had trusted her with and showing it to me when I was operating the elevator. And so we decided that was the one that we wanted, yes. Mm. So uh, that was, uh, but that I still then, you see, was not, was a long way. Because also we had the war come along and, and however, uh, we were married by then. We married in 38, I think it was. But uh, we, uh, during the war years, uh, then I, uh, they, uh, I went, was to be drafted, but I wasn't the tallest man that they had uh, <laughs> in front of them. And so uh, they said, get into defense work. And so I lucked out in going to uh, West, um, 
Western Pipe and Steel down in uh, uh, South, uh, South San Francisco, and there they were building ships, troop ships, and so uh, I got a job then as a marine electrician. They should, they trained me as a marine electrician, and so then I was working pulling the cables and uh, doing whatever had to be done to get lights and communication in the cabins. And uh, then when they, I, they finally were time for me to really be drafted, my third daughter had just been born, and they also uh, saw that I was leading a group of quite a few ladies uh, as uh, uh, foremen, and so consequently then I, uh, I didn't have to go into the army, but I stayed there and, and built the, the ships, and that was an interesting experience too. The thing that happened, we don't didn't in the, those days know that asbestos uh, would get into your lungs. But uh, and now today, I have shortage of breath uh, when I uh, exercise, and uh, so I have some residue from that, but not serious. At least it doesn't really bother me. It's just embarrassing. I have to sit and rest just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Works fine. So the way you said that, you, you basically were a foreman for Rosie the Riveters? No, uh, for welders. For welders. Yeah, we'd gotten away from the Riveter by then and were welders. And uh, I've had uh, marks on here where the weld had mm -hmm. done it. Uh, yeah, uh, one of my things I remember there was uh, in the night shift, uh, we had a large pole went up the center of the ship, and that's what they used is put the pulleys to. But I had to put the wire, the, the electric wire, up there, and so I had to be hold, sitting on, standing on one, and holding the other one while the welder was working on it. And I had to do it because I had a crew of about 15 people, but the fog was so heavy that they just refused to go up on there. And so when we were up at the very top and she hit the, the weld, the sparks there, I could see the shadow of the two of us on the fog up there, plain as day. And uh, it was that kind of an experience. So uh, working around a shipyard was, well, another thing that did happen, however, um, the um, form, the man that was over all of us uh, would thought this window dresser uh, was not much good and well, how come he's being an electrician? But um, we had all these wires that had to start at the um, switchboard and then they had to go down the hall and then this wire had to turn off and the others did not and so forth. So I got the idea of coloring those with colored paper and uh, colored pencil and it was so much easier to see and when he saw that you know he changed his opinion just a little bit. But uh, we kept, we did our job as good if not better than, than others and that was, that was really something to be proud of. So it worked out fine for the war years. Mm -hmm. yeah, were, so. you, were you in that position for the entire war? or? Uh, yes, pretty much so. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, pretty much so. Yeah, and then came back to city of Paris, so then I'd been there way and back again, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. You know, and they understood why, why I was away and why uh, that sort well, of thing. There were a lot of people away at that exactly. point in time. For, right, yeah. exactly, yeah. Um, the ladies were the ones too. We only had uh, three, two or three, three uh, musicians who were excused from going to war because they were in, in part of an entertainment situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, all of the others were ladies, but they were great to work with because they knew how to read and follow directions. They called it a recipe, and uh, so they knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we, got, we did our share of uh, uh, production, and uh, even though all of us, the, the ladies and the men, were pulling these heavy cables, cables were thicker than my thumb because they had one they had the wire, electric mm -hmm. wire in it, but they were metal on the outsides, and then we had to fasten them to the wall, you see, and we even had to make the uh, strap, we called it, out of metal to, to, to hold them in place. Mm -hmm. The bracket kind of. bracket thing, mm -hmm. we had to make that. So uh, it was it was educational. Wow! <laughs> yeah, got it done though. Um, what did you you graduated high school at the in the middle of the depression? Yes. And city of Paris, you got a job at city of Paris through a woman at the church. Right. What did you see around you? 
say around me. In terms of the depression, what was your experience of the depression? Yes. Well, I think because my mother was the sole support, we always said all we had a depression. So uh, I don't think there was much change there. And uh, the depression really didn't bother us very much. We had enough to eat and uh, we had our activity. Uh, she had her work and I had the church and, uh, and, and selling newspaper and so forth. Um, and when, uh, when uh, there was a lot of high, high times, uh, Lindbergh uh, flew the mm -hmm. Atlantic and uh, I got all the newspapers I could and walked around through the neighborhood and sold those out. Well, that was Murray. during your high school days, right? The, earlier. The, the, no, this was earlier. That's what I mean, yeah. that was 1927, wasn't Yeah, it? that's right, you see. I was, so I was still in suit, 1930. I, was, I hadn't graduated until I graduated in 1934. Right. Then in 1934, I stopped selling newspaper on the corner and got a job in the, selling the um, Chronicle, uh, delivering it to the Examiner building downtown, and I did that then all during high school. <coughs> so. Uh, I always was contributing a little bit mm -hmm. to the to the uh, to to do mom and so forth. So uh, the depression really didn't didn't hit us that much. Did your mom then raise the girls through the war while you were? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That was a, a wonderful arrangement. She they loved each other, all four of them, and uh, they teased her a lot, which was great. And uh, she so she was at home and uh, didn't have to get up, at, you know, didn't have to leave home to go down and work in, a, and she, oh, in the hospital she was working and cleaning bedpans and that sort of thing. So uh, this was much, much the same but much more pleasant, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, did you live in South San Francisco or were no, you, no, you well, I lived, commuted? I commuted, yes. Uh -huh. How did you do that? Uh, there was no major problem. Um, how did I commute? We Is there went a train? down there. Oh, I know. No, there was somebody that was driving. Uh, one of the people working there uh, had an automobile, and uh, I think I think that's what it was. I really have forgotten uh, how it got back and forth, but I know it was no major. And also, I worked sometimes in the day shift, sometimes in the night shift. So uh, whatever it was, it was no major. The other nice thing that happened too, uh, Pier 27 is uh, down close to the ferry building, and it wasn't too long before the finished ships that were to be, uh, where the well that had been made, had been manufactured, they were all ready to fly. They were brought up to San Francisco, and we worked on tra Pier 27. Hmm. And so that was a, a much, much, much easier. And that's why I did most of the uh, good part of the war was mm -hmm. there. I see. Yeah, you know, and that was just a bus. That was another thing that was interesting. Um, when I graduated from Lowell, there was no idea in those days of uh, 19 for, of going on to university uh, the way it be, has become. But uh, uh, I re somehow had a yearn to learn. And so I found a, down near the city of Paris, uh, at Third and Market Street, a uh, bookstore used books for 25 cents that went on every subject you'd think of, philosophy or fiction or uh, nonfiction, all of that. And so for 40 minutes every morning and 40 minutes every evening when I was on the streetcar, which is a lot easier to read on, stand and read than a bus, and anyway, then I, uh, whatever education I got, I got there by reading, and uh, the, the, it was very, very good. The only problem is I have trouble pronouncing words because <laughs> the book uh, was a reading. I wasn't quite sure sometimes, but anyway, that's whatever education I have really came uh, after high school there. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that bookstore then was only a block away from City of Paris. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it was, so it was very helpful. Yeah. You know. Um, and the price was right. There you go. <laughs> uh, boy. So you opened your business in what year then? Um, 
Must have been at, it, it was after the war. Be, it seems to be 38, uh, but that's only... Well, that's what... I, I that's, was, wait, 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 you opened your wait, business. Yeah, you're right, right. Uh, what's 17 and 31? Uh, 48. Okay, yeah, I opened it in 48. Okay, so three yeah. years after the war, basically. It, that was it. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. And three or four years yeah. ago. And Mr. Silvanus wanted to get out of the business and go into the chicken raising business down in Ben Lomond. Uh, that was another thing, part of my life, and that is that uh, along a ways, uh, we, Marty and I, built a house down in Ben Lomond and uh, the girls would go down there, Marty and the girls would go down there during the summer months and then I would go down on weekends and that sort of thing. And uh, that was an interesting experience all the way along. Mm -hmm. I know right now I'm not quite sure why we did it, but we did. And uh, the girls loved it and Marty liked it. And uh, I say I would commute down Highway 1 mm -hmm. uh, for 70 miles down to, uh, from San Francisco to Ben Lomond. That was interesting, different, completely different way to live. I can't quite place them, Ben Lomond. Is it south of Monterey or north? It's uh, Santa Cruz. Seven That's miles, what I was thinking. Was seven miles this side of Santa Cruz. That's yeah. right. We're yeah. uh, near the... Uh, What's the name of the other... Something point. point. Yes, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one yeah. right along there. Uh, right on... on uh, oh, it was also uh, inland from the mountain uh, in other words, you had the ocean, the mountain, and then Ben Lomond. Mm -hmm. uh, because I remember when uh, <laughs> we would uh, come back after the, uh, any time we were driving, and uh, we're here, and I would tell the girls, now go to the bathroom, uh, fine. Then we'd go over the mountain, we'd no longer hit all the water, then say, Daddy, Daddy. Mm -hmm. So they learned how to do their toiletry on the beach in, in uh, as uh, 40 paces around a sight, that's a, that's sight, that sort of thing. So uh, it was it was educational. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, when the when the bomb fell. Okay. In in, in Hiroshima. In Hiroshima and yes. Nagasaki. Yes. What was it like around here? I mean, VE mixed. Day was shortly after. I think it was mixed. I mean, VJ Day. Yes, I think it was mixed. Um, what is your opinion of when the bomb fell? Bomb fell? How do you mean? Uh, was it a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a, It's not black and white. It's not a good thing or a bad thing I see. in absolute. I mean, okay. you know, overall, I think it's a good thing because no you question. actually saved many, many thousands, if not idea. millions not of only, lives. Not only the Americans, the Europeans, but also the Japanese. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's why I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, it was uh, definitive. It, it was necessary, and it did the job. Yeah. So whenever that happens, then no matter how many babies were killed and all that sort of thing, it's still, to me, uh, a thing that was it, it, in the in the long run, it, it just saved so many lives and so much hardship that I think it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, anyway, it was uh, one of the things that happened, and and uh, we have to deal with these uh, catastrophes, uh, whether they're good or bad. We have to make them good. We have to do what we what we can do. Elaborate on that a little bit. Okay. Um, where was it that uh, we, uh, under President uh, uh, Trump, we, we bombed recently? Syria? Syria. Okay, fine. And uh, all we can hope is that that's kept something worse from happening. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a brave step to do it uh, and hope for the best. And that's, that's all you can do. You can't tell. Um, and I think that's the same thing true about this immigration uh, hassle that's going on now. They love to tell about the babies that were um, needed doctor's care and couldn't get into the United States. Uh, this kind of thing. But uh, we don't. Have, we haven't had. We've had a minimum amount of trouble with ISIS. So. Uh, 
that we we have to always have to remember the twin towers that were were uh, destroyed, uh -huh. and uh, it's uh, that could happen again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, let's back up again. Sure. Um, so you held your had your business until you retired. Yes. Well, actually, an interesting thing there. I had a grandson who graduated from Kansas State University and came out here to buy my business. And so he and his wife, and she was had one baby and expecting another uh, when uh, her brother came out here and talked him into paragliding out at the ocean beach. Uh, paragliding is one where there's a sausage over your head filled with helium or something like that and so then you're in the gondola below it and you control it by pulling ropes in various ways and uh, so uh, this is out at uh, Fort Funston right mm -hmm. along the ocean. Popular so, spot. Yeah, so anyway uh, he was in that and the wind was off, was coming ashore and so strong that he couldn't control it and he ended up uh, being <coughs> electrocuted uh, in the electric high tension wires <coughs> out there. So now they've had this business for a year, I guess, uh, when he was killed. So uh, grandfather then has to take it over back again, unretire, and send her and her children uh, back to her family in Kansas. And uh, we had that, so I had that for two years after my 50 years of uh, the, owning it originally, 52 years. But then I found a man who I had tra trained uh, when he graduated from university many, many years before. And he was working for, uh, he had learned the business through me and then also through other places where he worked. So he took over the business and has had it now for the 17 years uh, and have done very well with it. Uh, but uh, anyway, then after shortly after that, um, I came. Oh, and then I had uh, met a lady uh, who was uh, a resident here at uh, the Heritage. And uh, when uh, the man that bought my business upholstered something for her, she was so pleased that she wanted me to see it. And so I came here and saw it and signed up for to live here the next day. Hmm. And so now that's 52 years then. Uh, in the business, and then I came here. You know, hmm. you know interesting, a busy life. Yeah, <laughs> I would say so. Um, other historical events: uh, the day Kennedy was shot, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three. Yes. I don't think there were other things that were more 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 important. I think sure. I'm not sure it was the same. When the, that was 1963. When was the Loma Prieta? 1569, wasn't it? The Loma uh, Prieta was 89. 89. Okay, fine. Loma Prieta was interesting in that I was on a ladder um, with in a house. Uh, where uh, this part of the house was on the uh, land and this was all on stilts out here with a, another big area out here also on stilts. And so I'm on a ladder here when this uh, comes along. The two people ran out of the house of course, but this was five o'clock in the evening and I had another call to make and so consequently I stayed and finished what I had to do. Mr. George, you're the bravest man that we've ever seen. In the middle of the night it occurred to me, Mr. George, you're the stupidest man that uh, they've ever seen, but at least I got the job done. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's that kind of thing that I remember. Yeah. I don't remember the Kennedy situation very much then. Um, yeah, you spent most of your time, I imagine, with your head down sort of on business. Yes, well, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, my head up, but uh, <laughs> the same, <laughs> but the same thing. Yes, yeah. and on yeah. a ladder a lot of times. Was there um, any damage to your home during 
uh, nothing serious, you yeah. know, and not much serious uh, here either. So that, this this place is interesting. Uh, all around us is with a fill that was done well, shovel by shovel by shovelful from the bay, mm -hmm. except this is on solid solid land. Mm -hmm. This this area right along in here, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, there's that. But no, uh, nothing that that our home wasn't uh, anything serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I preached here two weeks later. Oh, did you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been here since 1983. Yes, I knew you'd been here 33 years or so. Um, and uh, during the earthquake, I was in Candlestick Park. Oh, yes. Watching the World Series. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And then had to drive home across the Golden Gate Bridge so you could see the marina yes. burning. Yes, uh-huh. I thought about you all A friend of mine, here. a nephew of mine, uh, was in the airplane for KGO, oh, yeah. and uh, he was over the bridge. He said, now, uh, the electricity is going to be going out soon. I can only say this once. A uh, part of the bridge has just, uh, the Oakland Bridge has just fallen into the water. And uh, so he was a witness and, and a reporter for that. So mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was a bad situation. No well, question. of course, the Cypress Freeway collapsed. Yes, so, yes, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Which is where I should have been had I not been at the game. I would have been driving there along you, the Cypress at 5.04 a.m. That's right. PM. Yes, that so often happens. We uh, can say that it might, what might have been, yes. What would you say the luckiest you were was? Yes. May have been standing on that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it, I guess, yes luckiest. I think my whole life has been very, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. All your kids are alive. Yeah, pardon? All of your girls are alive. Oh yes, life, and not only that, no matter whether they live in America, Africa, Australia, they're close. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful. They just they just love each other. They're only a year, they're all less than a year, a year apart. And uh, they just, uh, they really do love each other. Yeah, hmm. yeah, very good. Um, you mentioned the Twin Towers. Was that uh, oh, yes. traumatic yes. for you as well? Um, well, it made me realize what can be done uh, by uh, intelligent enemies. Uh, this was so different because these men came here. First off, it takes men dedicated to be willing to give their life for what they believe to be right. That's mm -hmm. dedication. Uh, secondly, uh, they had to learn uh, how to do what was necessary to take over these airplanes and then to control them uh, to do what they'd done knowing that it was going to end up in death. And so, uh, to me, that was it, it just showed uh, what faith can do, faith, and, and you just hope that it's uh, your, your faith in the right thing and not uh, injuring a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, we hear all sorts of stories. Here there was one man, uh, a son here, uh, who was on the top floor, but he'd been transferred down to a lower floor the day before, and so he was still alive whereas on the top floor they would all go and been killed, of course. Right. So it's that kind of uh, things that happen in our lives, too. Hmm. Tell me more about the church. How have you stayed active in the church apart from but prior to here? Yes. But didn't you? Well, you I just sort of grew into it, and somehow I was uh, elected to be a leader um, in the, uh, when we were just very, very young. Uh, it seemed to me that if we're going to have a song service, uh, everybody ought to have the words. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would get the books and make sure everybody have it, or I would get somebody to uh, print out the books for me and know where they were. So that was my job, right. and I tried to do that, I guess, with everything. Um, Sally, my second daughter, the other day was at the uh, uh, church on uh, 
uh, well, let's see, oh, that's a thing too. Um, in 1960, uh, we sold the church to this Seventh-day Adventist Anything. group, and then we went out on to and built a church from scratch uh, out there on. And so uh, right next door to it is a lodge uh, that has parties and that sort of thing on the Gunana Boulevard. So we re we worship there uh, and all. Uh, and, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, wall facing us as we would all be seated, uh, there was a uh, bull there, uh, a, a, an animal there with horns and all. And one time we had a Baptist uh, taught telling about his business, and he said, and when I look at the cross, and so he's looking at this animal with bull with, with horns on it, so he had to get around that. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, uh, then we built a very successful church. We had, when I was there, as many as 300 people, and it, now they're down to less than 100. And so, but they're renting the building out to other people. And mm -hmm. right at the moment now, there's quite a bit of land that wasn't used, and they're trying to get housing on that. So they're having an interesting discussion going on that. But um, anyway, the church, that we, we moved and built a church and all. Uh, we have a, uh, in the product, in this particular church, there's a stained glass window, then right below it there's a tub that we use for baptism with immersion, so we put tile all around it. It was very nice, but it's still hard, uh, hard looking. When I was in Hawaii, I saw a church, the same sort of thing there, but they had plants all around. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back, I showed them pictures of it, said, let's do that. But the only thing is, rather than have to care for the plants, we'll use artificial plants. And one of the le other leaders said, you will have no artificial plants in any church of mine. And I said, you're right, Ivor, I'm sorry, I'll say, we're going to have plants that are genuine reproductions. Oh, fine, no problem. <laughs> and 60 years later, we still have genuine reproductions. <laughs> so, well, uh, being in the fabric business, you uh, <laughs> understand. We were talking, do you travel? Yes. And it was so interesting the way it started. Uh, our youngest daughter, Nancy, and her uh, husband, Bob, married uh, from, uh, graduated from the University of California and uh, were married. And then they went immediately to London. Uh, he was uh, trained as an engineer to build airports. And so uh, he was to build an airport and work with building an airport outside London. And so uh, we uh, found that with the drapery business, after Thanksgiving, customers had done their decorating and there wasn't much doing until after New Year. So we decided to start cl uh, closing the store down completely and uh, putting a sign on the window. And it was very comforting when we came back. A uh, customer would say, Mr. George, we waited for you and now we're ready to do this and this and this. So um, it was interesting then Nancy was in London and uh, she got a job as a secretary. So of course she had to learn to uh, do the uh, English English rather than American English. Learn the foreign language. Exactly, a foreign <laughs> language. And the first one was a Mr. McKenzie. And so the uh, manager, uh, her boss told her that they used the S instead of the Z uh, for magazine and that sort of thing. And so that was fine. So she, the first name, McKenzie, she wrote an S then instead of a Z and all, and uh, he could have fired her, but he didn't. He thought it was funny. So uh, that's, the, that's who she was, and she got along fine learning and working there. But while they were there then, they studied Danish, and uh, he was to build an airport in Denmark, and so uh, they wanted to uh, be proficient and have some smattering of, of uh, proficiency in the language. And so then they went to Denmark. And so then we visited Denmark, but uh, we went there before they did and took a, seven, a six, seven day tour around Denmark, the Hans Christian Andersen tour, and uh, learned all about where he had been and who he was and so forth. And then when uh, we went back uh, later, uh, to Denmark, and they, while they were there, then we were able to show them places that they hadn't seen yet, and 
you know, sort of thing. And then uh, while they were there, he studied uh, uh, Mandarin because he was to get a job in Hong Kong. And so then they went out there and then they found out they'd learned the long, wrong Chinese language because they were South, so they needed Cantonese rather than Mandarin. So, but anyway, they got along fine. But it was this kind of thing of following our daughters and then also going to Africa and uh, so following our daughters. And we'd spend uh, 10 days or so out of our 21 days uh, with the daughter. And then the other 10 days, we'd go to Paris or Rome or uh, various places. And then when I came back and a customer would say, I'm going to Paris, I would write out some things, especially about department stores. I would uh, tell them, go to a department store and go up on the roof because you see the what beautiful view of the city and then also that's where the outdoor furniture is for sale and you kind of get an idea of how the people live and so forth and so on. And so uh, essentially we, we then for many, many, many years we studied, we traveled each week, each uh, uh, end of the year and uh, it worked out very well for us. Mm -hmm. It was just a good experience. So where all did you go? Uh, we went to, for in uh, Europe, of course. Uh, we went to Italy. Uh, we went to uh, more than once. Uh, we went to Paris. Uh, we went to, in uh, England, we went uh, two or three times. Our daughter living in Africa, we'd visit her, and then we'd stop at uh, London on the way back. So we got to be pretty well acquainted with some of these cities and uh, enjoyed what they had to offer and put up with what they didn't offer, <laughs> this sort of thing. And so uh, it was uh, it was an interesting way to do it. But we traveled a lot then and also other places in, in uh, Europe also. We never went up to Russia, uh, but uh, we went uh, up into, uh, along the Rhine River especially, I uh, enjoyed that thoroughly, and uh, places like that. Did you do some work while you were there? I mean, experiment, no. uh, uh, explore uh, fabrics or uh, plants we, uh, or anything? We would explore fabrics. I really didn't buy any fabrics, but I uh, uh, got a knowledge, especially in England, of the uh, furniture, uh, Chippendale mm -hmm. and Sheraton, Heppelwhite and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, and I found that very helpful later when I was working and could uh, mentioned the, uh, as I reupholstered a chair, mentioned the original, well, that's what the name of it was. Yeah, that's it was the thing. original Heppel White, exactly whatever that. it were. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, it was just all part of the, the whole life experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark and Marty would buy clothes <laughs> too. And, shopped. Uh, yeah, shop, do her shopping and this sort of thing. Yeah, we bought a lovely uh, fur coat and uh, had that for years until uh, they started to threaten uh, painting people that were wrecking, ruining the animals. So uh, we gave that coat to our daughter Nancy, who's in Australia, and uh, they still allow them, so she gets mileage out of it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to Australia? And you No, know, we never did. It was an interesting thing. Uh, her uh, husband at the time uh, thought Americans were boorish and uh, override uh, this sort of thing. So we never visited, and then when she so uh, married other people, we just didn't uh, didn't ever go there. We went to New Zealand and uh, places, lots of places like that, but we didn't ever get to to Australia mm -hmm. itself. Well, you started on discussing this travel thing as you and I were talking off camera about computers. How in the world did you get into computers? Uh, coming back from Europe on the Lurlane, they had a computer class, and uh, so they for five days uh, they told about the. Uh, this was very early. There were basic uh, computer was the language, and uh, that's here where they were teaching people to use the one and zero mm -hmm. and make their do their own work and that sort of thing. So you learned programming uh, pro in the early well, days. Well, I, I never took any of the program, but I knew that it was available. Mm -hmm. Yeah but I was learning the instrument itself and, and what it does. And uh, then I, when I got into it, I got into a, a program called Print Shop, mm -hmm. and uh, to me it's just magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it served, I can do anything that I want, uh, and many, many times on my tie, uh, I'll have a picture that looks like it's telling, it used to be a, a picture tells you a thousand words, 
believe me to say today that the people might not even be in the town in the country you know let alone what uh, what you're showing them and all so the computer does that too mm -hmm. yeah so I got to be friendly with with uh, with my computer well did Marty end up using computers in the business no uh, no she never did no she uh, used a computometer some but uh, not the uh, not the computer no, a contometer a com which is d d doing figuring this sort of thing. Okay. She, she'd had some training in it. Mm -hmm. I don't think she used it a lot in the business, but it was, it was available. Yeah. It wasn't. It, so it wasn't the old adding machine. No, uh, it was a little bit more advanced than that. Okay. Yeah. However, I'm not quite sure. I tried to stay out of that part of the <laughs> business. Believe me. And she stayed out of mine. How is it that you and Marty stayed in business for over 52 years? Uh, and avoided, a, or did you avoid the pillow board meetings or those kinds of things to keep your personal life and yes. your business well, life we, separate? We always had three employees, so that consequently we had to uh, adjust to that. But uh, I tried in the drapery business to make it a complete business, so I sold everything from curtain rods. I sold the, sold the fixtures the customer needed, and then when I sold the fabric, I showed the customer how to put it on the floor and, and put the drapery together and that sort of thing. And that worked out fine because next time they wanted draperies, they let me bake them for them. And then I had three employees in my workroom, but I found out that a uh, outside uh, employee, uh, outside uh, uh, shop uh, could do the job for me uh, without my worrying about whether the uh, salesperson, whether the sewer showed up or not, this sort of thing. And so I started farming it out. So then, uh, and the same with the upholstering, I never did. I did uh, some of the uh, dining room chair seats and that sort of simple upholstering, but the more of an advanced then. But I did. Uh, always pick up the chair. One of my favorite stories is uh, Sequoias here in San Francisco are 24 floors mm -hmm. and three elevators and I had two club chairs like the ones behind you and I put them into the uh, one into the elevator and saw on the corner of my eye saw the door closing so I waited and waited and waited and this elevator would come but not mine this not mine finally my elevator came with the chair still in there and the housekeeper who uh, I had met said uh, Mr. George I had a phone call saying there's a chair riding up and down by itself in the elevator and uh, so I thought it might be yours and so it's kind of thing. So, uh, But anyway I saved seventy, eighty dollars in uh, transporting then because I, I had my station wagon and so I would mm -hmm. deliver the furniture. Mm -hmm. Then I was always on the end of the sofa walking backwards to make sure they didn't scratch the walls and down ten flights of stairs if necessary. And, did that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, the part of when the store was going, just trying to uh, make it as um, economical and, and profitable as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's why now I'm so fortunate in that the uh, uh, monthly of, uh, amount we get from the government just covers my rent here. So uh, that's very nice. Well, that sort of thing. But, so how and how did you and Marty manage to stay married during all of that time between... She had her apartment and I had mine. So you basically didn't see each other at work? Exactly. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, except to help each other. Mm -hmm. But, uh, to, you know, to, to sometime we had to give a, an approval for some way or another. She had to come up for the money. Uh, but in those days it was 210 EOM, so the uh, tenth of the month, if you paid by then, you got 2% discount. Mm -hmm. And so we were always frugal and tried to uh, take advantage of anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it worked out all right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I remember those, those days myself. Oh. Um, so you learned on a personal computer? I or? learned uh, on a uh, personal computer, yes, always. But an early, early... Yeah. Early. What was your first computer? Uh, uh, an Epson, an Apple, a PC, IBM PC? PC. Yeah, yeah it was, was, was PC, yeah. yeah. And uh, always, always uh, had that. 
um, and the very basic part. I never got into any of the uh, this, but so much more advanced uh, computers than I have. But uh, what does the job for me? Mm -hmm. As they say, print shop is so uh, adaptable that it uh, it's, it serves my purpose beautifully. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You started to tell me another story, and I'm trying to remember what that was. Um, Travel or holiday? Oh, or? Well, I've got I've got another list here, so let, let's oh, talk about this. Good. It, fill in the blank. If I had it to do again. The man that bought my business, instead of being on West Portal Avenue at $8,000 a month, uh, moved to 15th and Terravel Street uh, in a building owned by the Masonic Institute, Masonic Group, and he pays $1,500 a month, $1, a month uh, 17 years ago, and still, as far as I know, pays the same amount of money. That's a great difference in uh, what we have to do. Uh, Paul has no employees. Uh, he doesn't sell curtain rods and that kind of thing, but he has a note on the door saying, I'm out on a call. Uh, this is my phone number. Please leave your message and I'll get back to you, uh, which he does. And so for um, all these years, uh, he's done it in an economical way, uh, the same sort of thing that I did and uh, has done very well. So uh, you think you're doing the best there is, but uh, there are many so times. So if, if you had to do it again, you would have revamped the way you did your business? I don't think so. I think I was pleased to have the complete business, mm -hmm. but uh, I also uh, find that it would be easier to, there's there been more profit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was very fortunate in that I made mine by uh, buying fabrics and uh, having them on stock mm -hmm. uh, so that I made my, my money that way, made extra money that way. I mean, in one of the way, one of the issues is that he got your business and he got your client list, so you built yes. a business for him. Exactly. And, sure. Yeah. And of course, I got it from the man from whom I bought it. Right, of course. Because, uh, so it's been quite a sequence, yeah. But still in business after all these years. Okay. Another question. What makes your blood boil? The other day, uh, we had a meeting here, and uh, we uh, were reviewing the fact that we have a hundred residents here, and we have a hundred people on the staff. Um, and suddenly, uh, ten or so of the important people in the health center have left and uh, others, uh, other uh, the, and leaders are leaving so that we're, we're having a changeover in the staff uh, that's quite, uh, quite uh, dramatic. And uh, one of our ladies here who uh, is a retired um, analyzer of business, I think she's very competent, has written a four-page document about it at all. And, um, uh, I'm a, and, and then a friend of mine, a uh, man that I've learned to respect, is in charge here, and now he's trying to answer all these questions and uh, not reveal anything I think that he's not supposed to reveal, this sort of thing. And uh, it remind, I, I, if I were in a, if this lady who's done all this and others who have gone along with her uh, were in a hotel, uh, they would never question the uh, staff changeover and that sort of thing, and I see it as somewhat of a similar thing here. It's none of their darn business, and I think that makes my blood boil. Hmm. Yeah, it's another. So meddling in somebody else's business. Precisely that, and creating a creating an unrest then among a hundred people, uh, where there's nothing that we can do about it. Mm -hmm. At least nothing we should be trying to do about it. Mm -hmm. When, well, yeah, I, 
that's sort of the same question. All right. Anything else that you... Why are you doing this? I am doing several things. First of all, I think it's important to what I'm calling uh, on one level, sort of as a working title, is oral histories of everyday people. I see. Good. Okay. That, That's that, all I need to know. Well, yeah. I'm also then trying to do other elements of it. And um, in that, it's a, sort of a, a theology of aging, how one's religious life or religious beliefs may change or how it sustained them. Yeah. Uh, for those like, you remember Fanny, uh, yes. a question of finding relevance. Uh -huh. I mean, you are exceptional in the way you find a, a, a way to help people and to uh -huh. keep going and other people will simply yeah. say, I, I don't know why I'm here. And Fanny was one of those. Yes. Uh, Lorraine decided it just was no reason to go on. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in exploring yeah, that element as well. Yeah. Uh, then I think from a sociological standpoint, there may be issues of value, and I don't know what yet, sure. but with the raw footage, if you will. That, yeah. Um, Somebody might be interested in, you know, the aging process as perceived by those people that are aging. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we're all aging, but... And, of course, this is so interesting in that the aging process has been so extended. A uh, hundred years is uh, not... Uh, not uh, not common. uncommon now. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was intrigued. For example, um, and I preached on this a while ago, long while ago. But Eric Erickson, the the uh, psychologist, okay, he wrote a he wrote a book basically the seven stages of man, and that at each point in development, you'd have sort of a an either or proposition. So. Uh -huh. Uh, you'd have start with as a baby. You'd learn trust versus mistrust. Oh, I see. Um, autonomy I... versus shame and doubt. Yeah. You know those kinds of things. And yes. he got up to aging. Yeah. And he wrote this about when he was fifty or sixty, I think. But he got up to aging, and he said the final stage is um, regenerativity or despair. Uh huh. Which is you know I how do you reinvent yourself when you're ninety? Very good. Or yeah. But when he got to be 90, he and his wife, yeah. they realized, well, that's not necessarily it. It's uh, not an either-or of regenerativity or despair, yeah. but it's uh, how you come to terms with the life you've lived and yeah. you spend time getting comfortable with yeah. what you've done and the mistakes you've made and or the successes you've had. Yeah. And, and so there is a process of... For, to be kind of crass about it, an yeah. exit interview that you're going through and yeah. resolving, if, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does very much, yeah. So, and so how you deal with it, too. How you deal with it is exactly it, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's still yeah. the element of despair that could be involved. Right. And or yeah. um, the comfort level of saying, okay, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with the fact that my life is... A little bit of envy, too. You went into the other room and got these books so easily, yeah. and uh, those days are past for me. Well, let me ask you that, because how is it you deal with that loss of autonomy? I mean, well, at some point, you gave up driving. First off, yeah. What you well, first off, if you get off uh, driving, uh, then you be, be, you're very happy that you have a daughter that will serve that for you, or the van that we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, the, uh, in other words, you substitute uh, something that uh, accomplishes, and then you cut down on the uh, need for those things, uh, both two ways you do it. And then with me, it's the uh, rollator uh, walker, uh, which makes it so much easier for mm -hmm. me to balance and not be afraid to fall. 
as I go around the room and then this uh, around the building and then this one also has a seat on it so that I can sit when I need to and rest which is what I do uh, and then also be very thankful that they have chairs at appropriate places get out of the elevator there's a chair there and I can sit there for several minutes till I feel a little stronger to go on mm -hmm. to the long run to the dining mm -hmm. room. So in other words you, you learn to adapt, uh, substitute and adapt, uh, something like that. That that adaptation process though is not as easy for some as for others uh -huh. would you say? Is that fair? Well. I mean, you, forcibly, you have to make accommodations. Yes, uh -huh. But for some, it's easy, and some, it's, it's not so easy. Well, I think the thing to do is to try to decide that it is, that, it, that it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Whether it's easy or not, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And so, you, for instance, instead of walking a long distance, you sit down every once in a while. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you feel about the way Lorraine died, in effect taking your own life. I feel uh, the way that it's similar to the way I feel about abortion. Uh, in other words, it's, a it's, a, it's to me a very practical uh, way to accomplish something. And in Lorraine's it was a very simple way uh, to uh, say, uh, this is enough. I'm done. Uh, we are done. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this that I've all my life thought was wonderful, uh, heaven, uh, and uh, now I'm going to find out. Mm -hmm. She was a very religious woman, wasn't she? Yes, I think so. I'm not sure. She was a very, very helpful woman, certainly that. I mm -hmm. guess, uh, I don't remember what church she went, I don't remember being a, a church person, but maybe she was. I just didn't, I, did, I don't know. Yeah, I understand. I, this is just an aside, but I understand from Betty that she quit coming to church because she didn't like the way I preached. I see. Okay. But who, who? Which Betty? Oh, this is Betty, Betty Dowell. Dowell. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll be darned. Yeah. Well, she yeah. thought I spent too much time talking about myself. I see. Which yeah, I'm always open to criticism. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I think that's what preaching is all about is adapting uh, uh, the life behind the, the, uh, the speaker to, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the present subject. Mm -hmm. Seems to me that's, that's, that's good preaching, so mm -hmm. I don't know. You said the church was your hobby. Yeah, more of that, that's a good way to put it, I guess. Yeah, well, that's what you said. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, what I, what I uh, really meant, I think, was that I never belonged to any other uh, community organization. Uh, what hmm. are some of the other clubs that uh, there are? Uh, so you were never a Rotarian or a Kiwanis or an Elk or something this like that? This was my only one. Was uh -huh. So uh, whatever that was, if that's a hobby, uh, then fine, that's what it was. Uh -huh. yeah. How did you get business? Pardon? How did you get business? How did you make... In um, the drapery business? In the drapery shade? business. Oh, How I did see. you expand your business? First off would be the display window. I had a very wide uh, store, 32 feet, and mm. I would have things in the window that I knew the ladies would be interested in as they'd go by on the streetcar, mm -hmm. and then they, they'd uh, come in, that sort of thing. And then uh, also I would uh, just try to be helpful if people came in and had uh, broken something and I would try to uh, be sure that I, and then when I'd be in their home, uh, I would uh, suggest things. Uh, many of the older people, not older people, but people worried about uh, possessions that they had, uh, and we'd be talking about it, and I would suggest that they put a note on the bottom of the piece of furniture, this one belongs to, and then name the person that they had promised it to, mm -hmm. that sort of thing and uh, they would appreciate it and tell their friends what I said and so that I'd get more business, something like that. So it, basically it was a business by referral? Uh, as opposed, yes, I mean, I think, yes, I think in the so. old day we'd refer to it as word of mouth, but referral is more intentional, which yeah, is what you did. Exactly that, yeah, I think so. Uh, but, and also by, by showing in the window 
uh, things, uh, whatever that would be, demonstration, I guess, uh, business by demonstration. Mm -hmm. So that means, in, in, I mean, I think one thing that may get lost is you actually had terrific traffic in front of that window. That's right. That the West Portal line was a very significant line. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, it sounds like that the gentleman that bought your business uh -huh. was able to do the same thing by and was on the Terraval line. Well, is that? Or, yeah, it's I, not as popular an area yes. because you had you didn't have every train well, coming had, out of the I tunnel. I had a large sign though that said, and I don't think he does. Oh, okay. So uh, I no, I don't think that that uh, he does. Of course, have the van, mm -hmm. and he would have the truck, and oh, it okay. has the name on it. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, not, our motto was everything for the window. We supply <clears throat> everything for the window except the view. Oh, that's good. <laughs> right. That's good. Any other stories? Any memories of you and Marty? Uh huh. Probably not in the middle of the night, but I won't phone you. <laughs> I don't, I don't, don't think of anything yeah. at the moment, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty well got it for us at this Let's point. Let's be sure to get something where I can send that uh, okay. uh, email uh, or send that picture to you. I probably, I would probably send you two of them. We had a uh, another show before this one and it didn't show as many ties, but it showed them in a more attractive way, so. Okay. Yeah.